Hi, this is Scott Allen, and this module is everything you want to know about async controller actions in ASP.NET MVC 4. For this module, I'll be using ASP.NET MVC 4 in Visual Studio 2012 because we want to take advantage of async and await operators, which are new for the C-Sharp compiler, and they make writing asynchronous code extremely easy. I'll show you how to write an async controller action and explain why you might want to use an async controller action, and we'll also look at parallel processing, timeouts, exceptions, unit testing, and have a brief introduction to the task parallel library along the way. If you need to build a highly scalable web application, then one of your goals is to keep the threads in your server process as busy as possible. In an environment like ASP.NET, there are only a limited number of threads reserved for processing HTTP requests. And if these threads have to wait for a long input-output operation to complete, you end up with those threads sitting idle and doing no work. The classic example of this is a controller action that needs to call another web service, an I.O. operation, to produce a result. A web service call that travels over the network, we often measure that in milliseconds. And if a web service call takes 250 milliseconds, then the processing thread has to sit idle for 250 milliseconds. If all the threads are tied up and idle, then any new HTTP requests that are arriving at the server, ASP.NET will queue them up and force them to wait for one of these request processing threads to free up. In previous versions of ASP.NET NVC, if you wanted to keep your threads busy, you needed to inherit from the async controller base class instead of the regular controller base class. Then you needed to split every action into two parts. The first part would kick off the long-running I.O. operations, like calling a web service, by initiating asynchronous operations and providing callbacks for when the operation is completed. The second part of the action would be notified when all the async operations were complete, and then it could put together a result, like a view result, for the framework to consume. So here's the source code where the first part of the action, the index async, would instantiate some web service clients and kick them off asynchronously. It would provide callbacks so that when the calls return, it could take the results and put them in a view model. And then we communicate with the async manager in ASP.NET MVC 3 to tell it how many operations are outstanding and how many operations are complete. And when all the operations are complete, it will automatically call index completed and pass in whatever parameters we specified so that we could render a view. Fortunately, all that stuff is gone. With ASP.NET MVC 4, it's much easier to keep our request threads busy without introducing all of this artificial complexity. We can free our threads up from running long input-output operations, and I want to make clear what we're going to talk about in this module is asynchronous behavior on the server. What we're going to cover has nothing to do with AJAX or asynchronous calls on the client. The client has no idea what's happening on the server, and these asynchronous features have no visible impact on the client's request, except in some cases it, it might speed things up. So this module is all about keeping server threads busy, and to understand how easy it is in MVC4, we first need a little bit of background on two other topics, the task parallel library and the async and await keywords in C-sharp. We'll start with the task parallel library. The task parallel library the TPL, has been around in the .NET framework since version 4. The TPL is designed to make it easy for you to work with threads and asynchronous operations, so you can run work in parallel or asynchronously and not have to worry about partitioning work and scheduling threads and some of the other low-level details we've always had to worry about with threads in the past. Although the TPL is very good at a number of things, like parallel processing, we're going to focus on using the library for asynchronous processing, on the web server, we're usually not as interested in parallel processing as we are in keeping request threads busy, which, if you think about it, is already a form of parallel processing because multiple HTTP requests can be executing in parallel. But to keep these server threads busy, we need to offload some input-output work, some I.O. work, make it asynchronous so that we don't block the request processing threads and make them sit idle. We're going to do this using one of the features of the TPL, which is the task class. Think of a task as this, as a representation of work that needs completed by some point in the future. So it's a representation of work. You can encapsulate operations and asynchronous operations in a task and then make them execute synchronously or asynchronously or in parallel. You can combine tasks together 
combine tasks with a callback, manage state across tasks. You can do all sorts of wonderful things through an API that makes the complicated things easy. Let's take a look in Visual Studio. Here inside of Visual Studio, I want to demonstrate the capabilities of the task class using a simple console mode program. Inside of the main method, this console mode program is going to call into a slow operation. That slow operation is going to take at least two seconds to complete thanks to the thread.sleep call, and then it's going to return a 42. In between, it's also going to print out the manage thread ID that started the operation and the manage thread ID that is executing when that method finishes. Then back in the main method, after the slow operation is complete, we'll print out the numbers from 0 to 9, show the slow operation result, and finally print out a message that we're complete and also show that thread ID. If I run that program right now, it's probably not surprising that we first have to wait for that slow operation to complete, then we can print out our numbers, then we can show the result, and everything happens on the same thread. The manage thread ID is 1 the entire way through. So let's change this around to use a task, because perhaps we want the slow operation to execute in parallel while we're printing out these other numbers, and that represents other work that we have to do, other processing that has to take place. And so what I'll do is I'll use the task class to create a task out of the slow operation, and that's as easy as going to task.factory, telling it that it needs to start a new task. This task will return an integer, and the work that we want represented is this slow operation. So it's going to turn the work that needs to be completed to finish that method call into a task, and I'll change this from result to task. Then you might ask, how do we get the integer return value? That's as easy as saying task.result. Now if the task is not completed at this point, then task.result will block the program at that point. It has to wait until the task completes before it can give you that integer value back. But there's other things we could do with the task. So while our other computations are happening, we could also walk up to this task and see if it's canceled, if it's completed, if it's faulted. We could also tell the task to continue with some other action and make that into a task so we can chain a series of these tasks together to get them all to operate serially. But for right now, we'll just leave it with task.result that will block right here and give us the result. And if I run this now, what we should see is that we can start printing out numbers while the slow operation is working. The slow operation is on a different thread now than the thread that's executing inside of the main method. The slow operation was on thread 3. The thread inside of main was on thread 1. And we still get the proper result, which is 42. That's a quick and simple demonstration of what tasks can do for you. We never had to worry about scheduling threads or starting a thread. It all just happened behind the scenes through this abstraction called a task. And next, we'll see how the C-sharp compiler here in Visual Studio 2012 can make this even more interesting using the async and await keywords. Asynchronous programming is everywhere these days. It doesn't matter if you're on the client or the server. On the client, you want asynchronous operations to take place because you want to keep the UI thread free. You don't want it to block on I.O. operations because then the UI freezes and it doesn't respond to the user's mouse clicks. This is why the A in AJAX stands for asynchronous, and it's partially why AJAX makes browser applications more responsive. It just keeps that UI thread free. On the server, we also want async operations because that keeps the request processing threads free from blocking on I.O. operations. It keeps them busy in executing and servicing network requests. There's such a demand for async programming these days that Microsoft introduced new keywords into the C-sharp language to make async programming simple. The keywords are async and await. A method marked with the async operator is what we call an asynchronous method. And inside of any asynchronous method, the await operator can suspend execution of a method until some task is complete. While the method is suspended, the caller is free to continue processing. And the calling thread can work without blocking and waiting for that method to finish. As a result, you can write code with a logical flow, but behind the scenes there's actually a thread jumping in and out of the method and keeping that thread busy. Asynchronous methods always return a task or task of T, ideally. You can also return void from an asynchronous method, but it's not usually recommended.
because the task is there to represent the work that is outstanding that needs to be completed. And if you don't re return a task, some frameworks can run into trouble because they don't know when your work is complete. So you typically want to return a task or task of T, and the method name itself should end with the word async. That's a clue to the caller that this is an asynchronous method. You'll find these async methods now all throughout the .NET framework in 4.5. And inside an async method, you should see one or more of these await operators. Those are the points where the thread of execution can jump out of the method and continue working somewhere else. Now, the async operator doesn't mean that this method will execute on a different thread. It simply means that the current thread calling into the method doesn't have to block inside of that method. Async and await essentially provide cooperative multitasking for a thread so it can stay hot. Let's take a look in our console application. Inside of the console mode application, I'm going to change slow operation into an async method. And that's as easy as adding the async keyword, but I need to make a few other changes too. First of all, I should really return a task of int instead of just an int now. In fact, I have to return task or task of t or void. And I'm going to change the method name from slow operation to slow operation async to follow the conventions set forth by the .NET framework. Now the other different thing I'm going to do inside of here is I'm going to use the await keyword. And instead of doing a thread.sleep, which blocks the thread, I'm going to do an await task.delay for 2000 milliseconds. That still introduces a two second delay, but instead of blocking the thread, it creates a task that represents work that has to delay for two seconds, and we're going to await that. So imagine if this was a call to some other web service or some IO operation, some method that other method that ends with async, I could await that async method. And that means the calling thread that calls into slow operation doesn't have to block at this point anymore like it did with a thread.sleep. Instead, it can await some task that represents a delay of two seconds. And since it's awaiting, the calling thread can jump out of the method at this point, continue processing somewhere else, and then that original thread or maybe some other thread when this delay task is finished can jump back in here at this point and finish off the method and complete the work. Now that slow operation async is an async method, and the c -sharp compiler is essentially going to generate a bunch of code behind the scenes that takes care of creating tasks and running a task and all that, I no longer need to do a start new on a task. Instead, I can just invoke slow operation. That will give me a task back, invoke slow operation async, and I can still get the result here. And I can still do all the other things that I might want to do with a task, like explicitly wait for it to finish at a certain point. That's a blocking call or using is canceled, is complete, continue with. But we'll continue going with this pattern where we just kick off the async operation, do some other work like printing out some numbers, and then we're ready for the result at this point. We'll block if need be so we can print out the result. And now if I run the application, it's gonna be a little bit different than what we saw before. You can see that the slow operation started on thread one, which is the th same thread that started into the main method. So we didn't jump to a different thread just by calling slow operation async. It was the same thread that was in the main method. But when we got to that delay, it got to come back and print out its numbers. And it just so happens in this case, in this console mode application, a different thread, thread with an ID of four, finished that async method for us and printed out the message slow operation completed on thread four. And this is why you can think of async await as a bit like cooperative multitasking. And in some environments, the thread that finishes that async method is the, going to be the same thread that started it. Most notably, if you're in an environment like WPF or Silverlight, where you have to perform certain tasks on a specific thread like the UI thread, then you can use async and await with the UI thread and always have the UI thread start the task and end the task. But it can do other work in between while the long running IO operations are executing like responding to events and keeping the UI refreshed and responsive. In ASP.NET, just like in this console mode application, you can see your code execute on different threads as it winds through these asynchronous methods, but that's not guaranteed. You can safely assume, though, if a request does jump threads, that the threads involved will always have the proper HTTP context for the request they are processing, and also the proper user identity and culture settings.
Let's just go ahead and see how async and await work in MVC4. Here we are inside of an ASP.NET MVC4 application that's still using the MVC3 approach to build an asynchronous controller. So derived from an asynchronous controller base class. And what I want to do is change this around to use the async await features that are in MVC4 and Visual Studio 2012 and see what an improvement it is. But before we do that, let's review what this home controller index method is essentially doing. It's calling two different web services, one to get the news, one to get the current weather, and both of those services are slow. They take around two seconds to complete a call to either one of those. So we're doing it asynchronously with help from the async manager. And I have some messages sprinkled throughout here so we can see which thread is executing which part of the code. And of course, by the time we get to index completed, we'll have built an entire model with the current news and the current weather and all our messages, and we'll be able to render a view. What it currently looks like is this. So there we can see the current news headline, current temperature. The total time to render was just over two seconds because those web service calls take two seconds to complete each, but we called them in parallel. So the elapsed time to render was just over 2,000 milliseconds. And we can see at least four different threads were involved. Thread 7 started the action. Thread 11 called into index complete. We had threads 14 and 13 finishing up work from our web service calls. And what I'd like to do, even before we get to async await, is now clean this up to get rid of all the MVC3 async stuff. Because it's actually going to be easier to go back to what it would look like when it was not asynchronous. And then add the async await keywords. That's how much they clean things up. So we'll instantiate the model, the news client, and the weather client. And I'd still like to add a message that says when we're starting the action. But then I'd just like to make synchronous calls for right now. And say model dot headline equals news client dot get headline. Just make a synchronous call. Model dot temperature equals weather client dot get current temperature. That's a synchronous call. That will put our model together. That's everything that we need for our model. And now what I could do is just take this code. Say that we're finishing up the action. We're going to return the view. We no longer need the index completed. And now this index method needs to return an action result or a view result. Now I'll do a quick build and we'll run this to see how it behaves. It shouldn't be very surprising if we see that everything occurs on a single thread and that it now takes over four seconds to complete. So there we go. A little over seven seconds. Maybe that's because I'm on a virtual machine and there's a lot of disk churning here when I recompile everything. So I'll refresh it for just a second. But you can see that the th action started on the same thread that it finished on. There we are with an elapsed time of just over four seconds. And we still get the same temperature and news headline, the ones that we expected. The important part to point out about this right now is that when a request thread comes in to start processing the index action, it is going to block and wait until we retrieve a headline. It is going to block and wait until we retrieve the current temperature. And that particular thread is not going to be able to do anything else while it's waiting for those web service calls to return. That's the first problem that we're going to solve with async and await.